Okay, that looks just about right, right? Yeah. All right. Well, good to see you all here this morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the great music and the reading. I want a great story. We've got more great stories coming up here. So we're talking about um, this whole month, we're talking about God in the house or God in your house. And today, particularly, we're talking about soul signals, or we could call that intuition. That's that the God's talk inside. That's that still small voice that we're listening to. And so this is what uh, we're going to talk about today, just how do we get in touch with that? How do we listen to it? How do we make sure that we're availing ourselves of it? So um, I'm going to start out with a story uh, about a woman named Sandy. She uh, was married to this guy. This is a true story. She, she was married to this guy, and his job was he was kind of an advertising guy, but, but his little gig was he'd get up on these stilts in some kind of a uh, uh, costume and advertise. So they were going to go to Las Vegas from California, and he had a gig there, and he was going to be dressed as Elvis and advertise whatever. And so... Um, uh, Sandy took the car into a mechanic wanting to make sure everything was going to be okay for this drive. So he goes to the mechanic and leaves the car there, comes back later, and the mechanic says, well, everything looks pretty good, except he said, your, t your tires were terrible. They were bald. He said, I found a reasonably priced set of tires for you, and I put them on. And she said, well, I appreciate that, but she said, I, don't, I really can't pay for them right now. And he said, well, that's okay. You pay for them when you can. And so she was, felt good going out of there knowing they were safe. On the other hand, <laughs> the money that he was going to get for the gig was going to go to pay for expenses and, you know, get them, get them above water a little bit, get their heads out of water a little bit. And so she was feeling like, oh, now we got to go do this and just to pay for the tires. And so she was feeling a little out of sorts, and she was driving home, and the drive home t took her by her church. And for some reason, again, that still small voice said, pull into the parking lot. And she didn't know why. She didn't have an appointment with the minister. She didn't even know if anybody was there. <clears throat> but the voice said she'd get this urge to do it, so she did it. She pulled into the parking lot. She walked into the church, and lo and behold, the minister happened to be there. The minister said, well, hi, uh, Julie, she, it, what, uh, Sandy, what are you doing here? And Sandy said, I really don't know. <laughs> this is interesting. Anyway, uh, she said, I don't know what. I just got an inkling that I should pull into the par parking lot. And the well, minister said, sit down. Tell me what's going on in your life. So she told her the story about the tires and the going to Las Vegas and stuff like that. And the minister said, well, she said, Sandy, you know, in our church here, we have a fund. It's called the Helping Hands Fund. And you've put money into it before. And it's for situations like this. We help our own, our own, our own uh, parishioners, our own congregants when there's a, a situation that, that they need help in. And she said, I'll, I'll draw you a check right now. And Sandy said, well, that would be great. That's just, I, I, I would be so appreciative of that would be wonderful. And so as the minister's getting this check ready, um, she's asking Sandy a little bit more about this Las Vegas gig. And well, Sandy said, my husband's up on the stilts and dressed as Elvis. And she said, here's another good thing that happened. He already had a Elvis costume, and they gave us a costume allowance. So that was extra money for us. And the minister said, well, do you have the Elvis wig? And Sandy said, as a matter of fact, that's the one thing we have yet to get. He, we didn't have the Elvis wig. And the minister goes over to her file cabinet, pulls out the third drawer, and pulls out a bag, and out of the bag she pulls an Elvis wig. Now, most of us keep an Elvis wig in a file drawer someplace. Most ministers do this. <laughs> this minister happened to have an Elvis wig in her file cabinet, and she gave it to Sandy, and Sandy walks out of there, and she's like, one more time, I've got concrete proof that I'm always supported, and all I had to do is, she listened when that voice said, 
pulled in that parking lot. And today, I'm going to ask Karen Nestingen to come forward because she's told me a story or two about uh, sometimes when she listened to her intuition. And I think there's nothing more provocative than hearing it from somebody that we know. So Karen, Thank you. take it away. Well, my story is from about 25 years ago. And I took a class that the Minneapolis Police Department was giving to citizens on self-safety. And I was kind of figuring, oh, this is going to be uh, some kind of what? Some kind of physical how to do whatever you do to protect yourself. Well, the woman who was teaching the class said, you never want to get that close to the person who's got a plan for you. What you want to do is you want to avoid the situation in the first place. So what this woman police person told us was trust your intuition. And she said when you're in a situation, if you're walking down the street and you see somebody coming at you and you just have a feeling like, I don't really want to get that close to that person, what she said was cross the street. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to feel stupid. <laughs> you know, so that's not that bad. Um, so shortly after this, we have an a apartment building that's made out of brick. And I was doing some tuck pointing in the front of the building. And I had propped the back door open because I was mixing my concrete. And then I would go down into the laundry room and get water and mix some more concrete and then walk around to the front and do some more tuck pointing. And you know, the stuff has to be kind of fresh, so you have to kind of not mix gobs of it. Um, and I was doing this and I came around and I went down in the basement to clean my tools and to get some more water and mix some more. And I had the worst feeling I have ever had in my life. And you know, when that reading was the person having a fuzzy feeling, there was nothing fuzzy about this feeling. This was just awful. And it's like, it just came over my whole body that fast. And I remembered what she said. And I just stood there. Now, I was probably 25 feet away from somebody who was hiding behind the laundry machines. And so I was close. Um, but I just stopped in my tracks and I said out loud, I just remembered I've got to go home now. I've got a meeting. Yeah. And I turned around, I locked the door, and left. And there was no rational, you know, there's no thinking, but that feeling, I've never had a feeling that strong. Um, and then the next morning, we got a call from one of the tenants that the laundry machines had been busted into the coin boxes and that um, you know the money was gone and the machines were smashed. So I was that close to that person. And you know the thing about intuition is there's no rationale. There's no rationale. And then uh, Joanna had asked me to tell this story and I thought of another story that's way less dramatic. Um, I usually walk down by the river every day or every other day. And there's a path that goes up along the road and then there's a lower path. And I often walk down on the lower path by myself and I feel perfectly fine. Um, well, maybe a month ago, I was going for a walk and I was gonna walk down on the lower path and my little voice said, don't do it. And of course I argued with myself. <laughs> and then I decided, you know, I'm just gonna listen to it. And so I didn't walk down on the lower path. Now, I don't know what I avoided. And that's okay. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> what nice examples of listening to our, our um, intuition, our that inner voice. Ernest Holmes says, our highest faculty is intuition, and it comes to a point sometimes where with no process of reasoning at all, we instantly know. No reasoning, we just know. So I'm going to give you three helpful things that uh, you, for you to consider in this area. First of all, is we have to realize that we have this soul signal. You got to be 
We have this. We have to realize this. Now, we aren't the only ones that have this, of course, and we probably notice it more with animals. We call it instinct. And, and uh, I think a lot of us are more aware of that because it is so apparent in animals. There's a turkey in Australia. The male and female build a big nest. It's a big messy nest with sticks and leaves, just a big heap. And on top of that heap, the, the female turkey lays the eggs and sits on those eggs. It's the male's job to make sure that those eggs stay at the same temperature. Not too hot, not too cold. And so what he does is when the, when the temperature goes up, he'll take some of that stuff off to get more circulation. If it's cold, he'll put more stuff around those eggs to keep them insulated. And the scientists say that those eggs stay within one degree. Can you believe, I mean, that's, that's how much that, that male turkey knows how to do that. And we know salmon is swim upstream at spawning time. Uh, we know about the homing pigeons. They know how to find home. And uh, the monarch butterflies, how they go to this little glen in Mexico. Who's been there? I have a couple girlfriends who have gone down there because they want to see all these. To me, it's creepy. But... <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to see all these all these butterflies, and they sit on the trees and the bark and the trunks, and then they they hibernate there, and then come back up north and and uh, never go back there again. But their young know exactly where to go. They go to that same glen. How does that happen? Some in, inner knowingness that these monarch butterflies have, and we have that same. Ability that same gift is given to each of us. We just tend not to use it. There's a a, a quote from a GE director of research. His name was G. C. Suit, and he said, "This is director of research, GE." Okay, he says, "After preparing yourself in your chosen field, you must be alert to hunches, and keep an open mind. Do not rely too much on logic." Try to locate the treasure chest of ideas, which is hidden within you. Can you imagine that's the way the head of research is talking? Don't think too much about logic. Go in here. Use your hunches. And then we, we should all do that. And our tendency is to, like Karen says, eh, I don't know if I should listen to that or not. You know, should I go to that lower trail or not? And I think that's what Jesus was talking about when he says, ye have eyes, but ye see not. Ye have ears, but ye don't hear. We just sometimes uh, sweep it under the rug. So it's very important that we are, are uh, conscious of the fact that we all have this gift. And then the second thing is to be open to that signal. And uh, uh, Reverend Debbie gave a great example of that a couple weeks ago when she was talking about this Zen master. Some of you missed it. Um, the Zen master was visited by a professor, and the professor came and said, well, I'd like to learn a little bit about Zen. And so the Zen master says, well, you know, I'm going to tell you a little bit. We talk a lot about <coughs> ethics and this and that. Oh, ethics. Yeah, he said, I, I know a lot about ethics. And he goes on to lecture, of course, the Zen master about ethics. And then the Zen master says, well, we also um, talk about the fact that we should only speak when we have actually something to say. And oh, yes, yes, I've, I've practiced this a lot. And I've got three different theories on it. And just goes on and on. And the Zen master says, uh, would you like some tea? The guy says, yeah, I'll have some tea. So the Zen master's pouring the tea, and he pours the tea in the cup, and he pours and pours, and the cup's overflowing. It's going all over everything. And the, the professor says, can't you see what you're doing there? The cup is full. And uh, the Zen master says, yeah. He says, I can see that. And can't you see your mind is completely full of old ideas? <laughs> you can't take in any more new ones, and you cannot possibly learn Zen. You know, sometimes that's what we, we don't have room, we're not, we're not open to using this gift within us. So we, it's very important that we think about this from time to time and get rid of old notions, make room for, for um, our God 
messages that we get from within. And then the third thing is we got to act upon it like, like Karen did. She stopped on those stairs and she said, oops, I got to go home. And, and, or, or uh, not going on that lower trail. Or like Sandy, the pull right into the church parking lot, didn't know if anybody was even there, but she pulled in because that, she got that nudge. So um, those are the things that um, we have to act on. There's a story of these two guys, they're in the pasture doing some work, they're friends, and far off in the pasture is this bull. All of a sudden, the bull starts pawing at the earth, and his head is down, and he's snorting, and he's all and he starts running towards him. And this one guy says, "He's going to attack us. He's going to hit us. Luckily, there's a tree here, so let's let's get up this tree." So the one guy climbs up the tree real fast, and he feels like he's safe. But the other guy's standing down there. The guy says, "Get up here! Get in the tree! The bull's coming!" The guy just stands there. Bull comes. Hits him, knocks him up in the air, smashes down on the ground, and the, the bull takes a look at him. He's happy, so he trots away. The other guy comes down from the tree, and he stands over this guy, and the guy looks up at him, and he said, I thought for sure the Lord would save me. <laughs> and the guy that was in the tree said, well, he tried. He said, get up in the yeah. tree, get up in the tree. Sort of like the story about the flood and the guy on the roof, and they sent the helicopter and all that, but... Lord will save me. Sometimes we have to act. Take action. In the Science of Mind textbook, Holmes says, the spirit within us is God, and only to the degree that we listen to and seek to obey this signal shall we really succeed. The spirit within us is God, and to the degree we listen and seek to obey shall we really succeed? And we just got very good examples of how that, how that all works in real life. So I'm suggesting that uh, it's the time to listen, time to obey, and uh, do what we're told. Mary Morrison, Morrissey, in her book, uh, Building Your Field of Dreams, writes this. She says, calmly, clearly, without judgment, our inner voice is always ready to help us move toward our highest good any time we choose to listen. As we increasingly listen and follow our inner guidance, we find ourselves navigated to our dream. You will be told very specifically, listen and you will be led. Remember, God can do for us only what God can do through us. Willingly follow your voice of God, even if you'd rather sit home and fret. <laughs> listen and move. And there's two reasons that, that we should listen to the voice. One of them, of course, is that, le that, that voice leads us to our higher, highest and best. Why not? The second reason is the more we listen to it, the more we work that muscle that muscle that's within us. The more we listen to it, the easier it is to use the next time and the next time. And if we don't use it, when, when it's talking to us, it gets weaker. So it's very important that we listen and actually make use of it. So first, realize you have it. Second, be open to it. And third, act on it. So. Do you ever wonder when you got those feelings? I'm sure Karen went through this. Is that my ego or is that my inner God stuff talking to me? Is that my soul signal or is that my ego? Am I just tired of doing this tuck stuff on this apartment building <laughs> that I want to go home? Or is there some danger here? So how do we know that? How do we know the difference? Well, it's kind of like when uh, what uh, Ernest Holmes says about doing treatment. He says, when you're thinking about doing treatment for something, should I pray for this or not? If it's for the good of all, harm of none, go for it. Good of, good of all, harm of none, go for it. And in this case, does what I'm hearing empower me? And do I intentionally harm no one? So when this still small voice speaks to us, 
it is never one of punishment or of correction or of um, of um, scolding or anything like that. It's not condemning anything. It's always empowering. It's uplifting. It's got integrity. It's honest. And so that's how we can know what that still small voice is. So um, just in case you're wanting more God in your house, in your life, these are some things you can remember to just know that you've got that power within, be open to it, and to use it. And I'm going to close today with um, a spiritual mind treatment, and uh, the bulk of it is our words from Ernest Holmes, uh, the beginning and the end are mine. You'll recognize those words. So just if you would uh, take a deep breath and just relax where you are, knowing you have nowhere else to go, nowhere else to be right at this moment. Just relax your body. And I know that that power within is the power that created everything and everyone. It is that same power that experiences life in, through, and as its creation. I am a center in the divine mind, a point of God-conscious life, truth, and action. My affairs are divinely guided and guarded into right action, into correct results. Everything I think, say, or do is stimulated by truth. There is power in this word that I speak because it is of the truth and it is the truth. There's perfect and continuous right action in my life and affairs. Right action alone has power. And power is God, the living Spirit Almighty. This Spirit animates everything I think, say, or do. Ideas come to me daily, and these ideas are divine ideas. They direct me and sustain me without effort. I am compelled to the do the right thing at the right time, to say the right word at the right time, to follow the right course at all times. I know that this is the truth, and the truth sets me free. So in gratitude for the law, the law being, it is done unto me as I believe, I release these words now to the law for perfect manifestation. So it is.